so beautiful. Perhaps love. We know that love is the most powerful energy in the universe. And I love our theme this month, Sacred Contracts, and that everyone that we have invited into our lives, whether consciously or subconsciously, consciously is always wonderful. The Courts of Miracles states that we have created in our lives our lovers and teachers. And the lovers in our lives, they affirm us, they cheer us on, they know who we are, we feel great, we feel expansive in their presence, and it's wonderful. And our teachers uh, may point out certain flaws, certain you know criticisms about uh, who we are and how we express. Now, if we have healed the issues in which they are uh, bringing to our notice, there's no energy charge, right? You kind of shrug and that's their opinion. Bless them on their way. Go with God, but by all means go. <laughs> and uh, if we have an energy charge, we have unfinished business. So that too is a sacred contract that we've come together to heal some unfinished business within our emotional body. And, uh, you know, my husband, uh, late husband, Neil Stroud, was just the most amazing person on the planet. And I don't say that because he moved on. He just was. And he taught in a disadvantaged area school, fifth grade English as a second language. And uh, he taught self-esteem. In fact, Jack Canfield used to come to the school in those days. No one knew who Jack Canfield was, but he wrote a book called 101 Ways to teach self-esteem in the classroom. Jack was a teacher. And uh, so Neil used and he implemented uh, those wonderful, wonderful uh, pointers from Jack's book. And all the kids loved him. And uh, they were, you know, in a, a poverty area. So he had them collecting tin cans, recycling, so that at the end of the term, he took everybody to Magic Mount and they'd earned it themselves. And we had, you know, we certainly had our challenges when our baby girl was three days old and he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And we went through some incredible experiences. And then when he did pass, you know, it was very, very devastating. And the day does come, I want each and every one of you to know, the day comes when we cease to weep that it's over and we begin to rejoice that it happened. That day does come. However, we're part of the human condition. We grieve our losses. And that when Dostoevsky said that I may be worthy of my sufferings, that means that when we transcend that suffering and we feel redeemed through that suffering, what do we do? As the ancient Bodhisattva went out into the marketplace with healing, helping hands, we serve others through what we've learned. Now, when Neil passed away, uh, I was uh, asked to uh, give a presentation at a Silamar for the uh, United Church of Religious Science. And uh, those are all Centers for Spiritual Living now. The name was changed because people used to confuse it with Scientology. And so they, uh, the RSI group, there was a split in religious science, even though they teach and preach oneness there was a split. And so there was like an international group called RSI, and then there was the United group, and I was part of the United. I uh, understand that they've now come together and united and call themselves Centers for Spiritual Living, which you get it, it's that it's a spiritual foundation. And when Dr. Holmes was asked, you know, in a, in a word, what is religious science? He said, the laws of science, the opinions of philosophy, the revelations of religion applied to human needs and the aspirations of every living soul. So it, when we look at the laws of science, cause and effect, that there's a cause and effect relationship. And that when we are conscious and we're living consciously, we're aware of this. When we're living unconsciously, uh, we think that we're at the effect of life, we're the victim, you know, all of these things come in. I'm so reminded of the ancient uh, legend where the high priest went out into the forest and an arrow came through, you know, the forest and hit him 
in the chest. And he was so livid that he said to uh, his devotees that were with him, he said, find out who did this. And they wanted to extract the arrow. And he said, no, we will not extract the arrow until you find out who did this. And they were, you know, scurrying around in the forest. It was, you know, obviously an accident, even though nothing happens by chance. Everything is a divine appointment, a sacred contract, a sacred relationship. So by the time they found uh, the young man who had released the arrow, uh, what happened? The high priest died because he was so unwilling to pull it out. So that is so profound when we pull out and actually unearth what's going on inside of us. That's healing. That is true healing. And when we attract relationships, see, people think a sacred relationship is just this wonderful, loving, fabulous thing. But it's all of it. And as Reverend Damien read to us, that when we think this is good and that's bad, that's duality. It's all just experience. And when we can wrap our mind around that it's just experience, yes, life is about contractions and expansions. And when we, you know, we contract and we expand, we contract, we expand, but we never contract to the original place from which we, we began. We keep evolving. And we allow ourselves be, to become more conscious. So when Neil Stroud passed away, I was uh, I, the founder of the Santa Clarita Church of Religious Science. And I was there for three years. And when I presented at Asilomar, California, the board of trustees of the San Diego uh, Church came to me and said, would you be interested in being, coming to San Diego and being our minister? Well, you know, I thought San Diego was just kind of a place you pass through on the way to Tijuana. I mean, I really didn't have a sense of, of San Diego or La Jolla or any of it. And so I said, uh, well, I can think about it. And so I drove down to San Diego to, you know, give my talk. And then one of the board members uh, had his pilot's license and a plane. And he flew me just like all over San Diego and along the coast. And it was absolutely beautiful. And so I made the decision that I needed to leave the uh, ministry that I had founded in Santa Clarita. And uh, when I accepted that call to San Diego, a whole new world, I was so sheltered, a whole new world opened up for me. And when we get it at a very deep level, that we're here to what? Fulfill our destiny. And as we draw these energies in, that when we consciously allow ourselves to know that we've invited it in. And I had met the uh, assistant mayor of San Diego. He's very charming. He was good looking and, and uh, really quite wonderful. And um, we ended up getting married. And um, he was an adult child of alcoholics and I was an adult child of alcoholics. So we came together and we had all this unfinished business, unbelievable unfinished business. A lot of it was in the papers too, because <laughs> uh, it, it was amazing. I, we went to the uh, city psychiatrist and uh, I was willing to do that, you know, to work through whatever we needed to work through. But I want you to know that John Bradshaw wasn't even on the scene then that much. And uh, healing the shame that binds you when you're raised in these alcoholic uh, homes. I became the archetype of the overachiever. You know, that I would, you know, felt if I went so far and I did so much that my past wouldn't touch me. But the truth is, what does it do? Goes underground, doesn't it? And runs us. So we never feel enough. We're never doing enough. We're never, you know, young enough or old enough or pretty enough or all of the things we just don't feel enough. So we overgive just to feel accepted. That's the archetype of the overachiever. Now, my sister took on the archetype of the disappearing child and the rebel. So when my father would say, you're never going to amount to each other, she'd say, you're right. Where I would, you know, have that energy within me to overachieve, to make him wrong, okay? 
So we had this unfinished business. And as we came together, we just, you know, it, it just, he was a rageaholic. He would throw things through windows. I was in my car, he was in his car, and he hit me in his brand new car sitting, you know, I'm in my car. So then he would have to, you know, repair things. So when I was sitting with the psychiatrist at the city and he got up to excuse himself, the psychiatrist said, Sharon, what I'm aware of is that you have a life's work. And if you stay married to him, he will become your life's work. I got up from there. I went straight to an attorney and I filed for divorce and we had been married two years. And when I got deeply involved with John Bradshaw and I had him come and speak at our ministry, Healing the Shame That Binds You and all the wonderful books. And he too was an alcoholic recovered and recovering and an adult child of an alcoholic home. And it was so revelatory for me that you know, I wrote a letter uh, to my former husband and said, you know, this has been so healing and so wonderful. And he said, well, I just don't want to dig up my past. So he kept the subconscious, the, all of the self-esteem issues, all of the things that run us when we don't feel enough, uh, he was unwilling to look at. But I wanted to extend the olive branch to him. And I mean, he said some terrible things about me to the press. I mean, talked about my lascivious life and all of these horrible things that were untrue. And the following Sunday, I mean, he thought he's going to destroy me, right, in my ministry. The following Sunday, we had standing room only. They wanted to see this woman that has, you know, brought this, uh, the uh, assistant mayor of San Diego uh, to such a place, right? And uh, he never won, you know, he never won. He ran for the assembly, Congress, several, he never won another election. Putting, okay, the laws of science cause and effect. He never won another election. Putting all of that energy out, trying to destroy me, what did he do? He destroyed what he wanted, right? That's the law of cause and effect. And on my 50th birthday, I invited he and his fourth wife uh, to my party and uh, he did come and I said I'm just so very grateful that you came because I want you to know you made a huge difference in my life and he really did on many many levels and gave him a hug and he said you know I really wouldn't have missed it and that in that moment in my own healing of my own past and my own issues you know, I had nothing but compassion for us. We did love each other very much. We just, you know, had so much unfinished business, we couldn't get past it. So when we begin to address what's running us in these sacred uh, relationships, and they are sacred because when we learn what we need to know to move on, everyone and anyone who comes within our energy field is healed and uplifted in our presence. This is how it works. And as Dr. Ernest Holmes said, it works if we work it. However, it appears not to work if we're not working it, but it's working the way we're working it. And if we're putting out negativity, you know, that's going to come back to us. We're not going to win elections. We're not going to be out there doing what we're doing, loving what we do and doing what we love. The greatest combination in life than that. And I just close these things to you because this has been part of my journey in the 46 years of my ministry. And that I was widowed at 32 years old. I remarried at 37 with unfinished business. And so at 39, I was divorced, right? And through that process of self-discovery, I became a much better minister as far as counseling, much more compassionate in my heart rather than that metaphysics has a tendency to be mental. But I made the longest journey on the planet, the 18 inch journey from the head to the heart. The heart is the doorway to the soul, isn't it? It is the doorway to the soul. Keep your heart in all diligence for out of it come the issues of life, we're told. So on this amazing day, and we're celebrating our 20th year here at Interfaith Spiritual Center worldwide, and the opportunity that we have to keep growing and evolving 
and expanding our consciousness. As long as we are here, we're here to grow and to learn and to open our minds and to acknowledge, you know, whenever I have an energy charge now, I just look at it and say, hmm, what is the message in this? We know there's a message, you know, we may, you know, kind of shine it on at first, looking at them, but what is the message for me? And to receive that message, right? And to realize we're never gonna outgive God. We are never going to outgive God. And so we give with that heart of compassion and the recognition that we're in the world to live, to love, to laugh, to express, to be all that we can be. And if we need to weep, what are our tears? Aren't they just that gentle, beautiful energy? For every tear that falls, a flower grows in consciousness, doesn't it? We're watering something and releasing something within us. And tears of joy. Joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God. Joy. So when you look at your sacred relationships and stuff comes up, Fabulous, because what? We get to deal with it. It has surfaced. And when it's surfaced, then we can take a very objective look at it and say, what do I need to own here? And what do I need to release here? And what do I need to embody? If my daily life is my temple and religion, what is it that I need to embody? And I will, you know, share something, a funny story. I have shared it uh, a few times in the 46 years of my ministry that when I thought I just totally healed it with the deputy mayor of San Diego, I was, uh, uh, we went, we sold our church in Mission Valley and we went into a 22,000 square foot facility up on the hill off of 163 in San Diego. 22,000 square feet, and we had a 1,000 people at each service. And I was rounding the corner to go up to uh, get me to the church on time, right? And on the corner, there was this huge sign. Now, this is when we know that we still have unfinished business. There was this huge sign, and it had, you know, his name. He's He passed away in 2019, so I bless you, Bill. Uh, and it said, you know, with his name running for Congress on our church property on the corner. So I'm turning the corner and I screech on the brakes. I stop the car. I get out and I see the sign and I just start pulling on it like this. Once I got it down, I went stamped on it. Then I went in uh, to my beautiful sanctuary and a thousand people and gave one of the most moving talks I'd ever given on unconditional love. And then I said, you know, a very funny thing happened on the way into the church. And I shared about the sign and how I stamped on it and all of this. So I said, I think I still have some work to do. <laughs> I think I still have some work to do on that. So when stuff comes up, we think we still have some work to do. And you know what? As long as we're here on the planet, we have work to do. And isn't it wonderful when we heal those issues that we can be of service to ourselves, others, and ultimately the planet. This is why I love our way of life, that we are in a sacred relationship and that we're here to heal and to inspire and to teach and empower through our daily lives, which is our temple and our religion, because we're all going somewhere. Where is it? Higher yet. Where is it? Higher yet. Where is it? Higher yet. Because we are in a high place and we will not come down. None of these outer things move us. We are in a high place and we will not come down. So I say to you, namaste. The divinity within me salutes the divinity within you. And the divinity within you salutes the divinity within me. And if I am in that place in me, and you are in that place in you, there truly is only one of us. Shalom, the peace that passes all understanding. And God bless us every day.